Okay, so let's start. So welcome everybody to this NFCore tutorial talk uh, workshop. Let's call it like this. It's a great pleasure to have uh, Phil Evels. I almost like it, not, did not pronounce that name perfectly, but I will try hard um, to give this talk and, uh, and introduce us to the NFCore community and also the different ways of uh, for their uh, implementation ideas to make Nextflow implementation more robust. So this is very uh, interesting for us because we have now also a few Nextflow workflows implemented, but they are most likely not too robust. And uh, for that, uh, these ideas and may also implementing it in the NF core way might bring our work a big step forward. So yeah, um, I think that's it. So I will give you the stage and thanks again for being available and uh, for giving this nice talk. Awesome. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, it's actually a really good timing invite to, to come and get the opportunity to talk to you guys because uh, we've been thinking more about how to kind of branch out beyond just the genomics community with NFCore and try and get more workflows involved. And uh, we're starting to see more involvement from, from other parts of the, of the life sciences and especially. So uh, I think the, the timing is great. And uh, I think we have a, hopefully a lot in common, certainly in, in the things we're aiming for. So it, I, I hope we can work together. Um, I've put together a talk, which is kind of a bit of a, an introduction um, to, to Nextflow and NF Core. I haven't focused on Nextflow very much because it's my understanding that most people watching will be fairly familiar with Nextflow already. Like you say, you already have some workflows, you know kind of what Nextflow is and, and how it works. So I'll talk a little bit about what NF Core is, um, how we work, and give a few examples um, of kind of nice extra things that, that you get if you're if you develop as part of the NF Core community. And then I'll, we can hopefully have a bit of a discussion at the end. And if you have any questions, just kind of shout. Them. Right, let me kick off. So uh, the tagline that I use for NF Core pretty much everywhere is that it's a community effort to collect a curated set of analysis pipelines built using Nextflow. And um, the key is that it's a, a really as we try and focus on, it's not just a website that lists Nextflow workflows, we are a community that comes together to work together to build a single kind of gold standard of, of pipelines, if you like. We're focused purely on Nextflow. Um, we, we, we talk a lot with other communities, but uh, with everything within NF Core is just Nextflow. So Nextflow is this workflow manager. It's, it's fantastic, of course, um, <laughs> as you all know. It works across pretty much every computing environment um, you can think of. So we use it on our HPC system with Slurm. Um, you can use it with Grid Engine, with PBS. You can use it on um, more kind of futuristic things like Kubernetes, and it, and it works great on, on cloud, AWS, Google, I think Azure is in the works. Um, so pretty much wherever you want to run your workflow, you, you can do that. It also has integration for Conda, for Docker, and for Singularity, which is fantastic because it means that as long as you have Nextflow installed and one of these tools installed, then you can run basically any Nextflow pipeline without having to think about the software that it in entails. Um, it's also massively reproducible. If you use a Docker container, so we recommend Docker and Singularity if at all possible, then you know that if you come back and run a pipeline that you did three years ago, as long as you use the same release with the same tagged Docker container, you're going to be using exactly the same software almost down to the byte. So it's extremely reproducible, uh, which is a fantastic step forward, I think. So that's next though. What, what does NF Core bring to the table? What, what's different about the NF Core community? Um, NF Core was started actually on one of the Nextflow group uh, user meetings. And there's kind of a few of us who came together and um, took the pipelines we had already and started to put together a set of what we thought were kind of best practice guidelines. Um, so these are we're now kind of a set of guidelines or rules that if you're a part of the NF Core community, we say your pipeline must do these things like simple stuff. It must be open source. It must have an MIT license. Um, so through to kind of slightly more um, non-obvious stuff. Um, for example, we try to have only one pipeline per data type. So there's one RNA pipeline. It can do lots of different things and it has lots of options, but there's just one. Um, and this, this is deliberate means that if you're a user coming in and you want to do this kind of analysis, you don't have to think about which pipeline is best. You just find the RNA pipeline. 
So we have a set of guidelines which we adhere to, uh, best practices. And we also develop a set of tools, kind of helper tools. Um, this mostly comes down to a, a single package called NF Core, which is actually written in Python. It's on PyPy and, and Conda. Um, and this kind of mostly is, uh, it has some functionality for end users. For example, you can list the NF Core pipelines and, and download them and automatically so you can transfer to an offline system, things like this. But it also has a lot of tools for developers who are writing Nextflow pipelines. Of course, you can use this, the hope is, even if you're not developing within NF Core, but it's primarily targeted at, at NF Core developers. And then finally, the thing which is kind of most obvious is we have a resource of pipelines which are ready to go, which are these best practice um, gold standard pipelines. And the hope is that basically we want as many people to come together and work on together on a single set of these pipelines rather than each group kind of developing their own flavor of what is essentially the same tool. So if you go to the NF Core website and click on pipelines, you'll see this big long list of all the different pipelines we have. Um, this is one slide that I have to update every single time I give a talk because the numbers change frequently. But I think as of a couple of days ago, we had 24 pipelines which had uh, at least one stable release. Um, 16 pipelines under development, which means that they have no stable releases yet. But And these vary from, from some pipelines which are, have very little in them, which are still pretty much just kind of the, the original template through to some which are, are basically fully functional, fully fledged pipelines, uh, which are already being used in production workflows, but they're kind of just getting towards their, their first release. And then we have, we never delete a workflow um, because that would be bad for reproducibility. So when a pipeline is no longer actively developed, uh, we archive it and we have four archived. Um, we try and kind of talk to the community as much as possible around us. Um, and this is kind of one of our main kind of, we really try to kind of adhere to those, those fair buzzwords that are findable, accessible and so on. Um, and so we have kind of ongoing initiatives with, with a few different um, groups around us. Um, probably the most developed is DocStore, where we're working together to build up full automation so that all NF Core releases are automatically picked up by DocStore and, and listed there. Um, something similar with Workflow Hub started more recently. And we're hoping soon to also have similar automation on the Elixir biotools. So all of these NF Core pipelines, if not already, will soon be listed automatically on all these different sites to make them as findable as possible and to really kind of tie into these other systems. The NF Core community has grown massively since it's not been around for that long. I think we first kicked it off. I think the idea came around at the end of 2017 and we actually started it the start of 2018. So we're, we're not very old. Um, and it really has caught me by surprise the speed of growth within the community. It's been fantastic to watch. Um, these graphs are a bit out of date, they're from the publication, but you can find uh, live versions which are up to date as of today if you go to the URL at the top. And you can basically see this kind of pretty, pretty steady growth of, of people contributing within Slack, within NF Core, within the GitHub organization. Uh, and this, these lovely graphs showing how fast we are to respond to issues and pull requests and things. So basically, we're still very much in this kind of initial growth stage of the community, which, which is brilliant. Um, I think these numbers are more up to date, and you can see now that we have uh, about over 800, nearly 900 people on our Slack organization. So many of these people come, are trying to run the pipeline and come and ask for help. But maybe when they have help, they might not use the Slack so much. Of maybe 150 people who are using it on a regular basis. Um, and then in terms of contributors, we have about 500 or so people who have at least made an issue or added some code to at least one pipeline. Uh, and about just under 200 people have actually actively signed up to the GitHub organization. We have a lot of work now under those two years. With this many contributors, you quickly rack up commits and, uh, and pull requests, which is, I don't know, I, I find this kind of staggering, these numbers every time I look. Um, so we're, we're a fast growing community and we're very active. We're pretty much all over the world now. Um, we'd still like to obviously have better representation in some of those empty parts of the map. But, uh, but this is the web traffic um, on, on the NF Core website and you can see we're, we've got a pretty active presence most places where there's um, kind of a lot of research going on. Okay, so that was kind of an introduction to, to Nextflow and NF Core. Hopefully it's clear um the difference between nf core and nextflow we are kind of side by side with some overlap 
um, but we are kind of distinct entities. Um, so how does it work if you want to come in? If you've got an idea for a pipeline and you want to come in and kind of work with NF Core, how, how does that happen? Uh, kind of roughly, very roughly, there's a, a three steps to this. And this is detailed and a lot of a lot more description on the NF Core website if you want to dig into the details. But the first step, which is really important, is you, you should come and join the NF Core community uh, as early as possible. Um, you can go to our website and find all these different channels. The most important one is probably Slack. Uh, where we have all of our kind of messaging and, and communicate about all this stuff. Uh, and specifically in terms of this point, when you join Slack, you'll find there's a, a channel on Slack called New Pipelines. So if you have an idea for pipeline, you need to come in and, and tell us as soon as possible. Um, this is important because, like I say, we try and make sure there's only one pipeline per data type. So if someone else is already developing a similar pipeline, we want you guys to kind of collaborate and work together rather than turning up with a finished pipeline um, and having to resolve that. So first step, come and join the community, tell us what your idea is, and, and you never know, you might recruit some help straight away. Once you're ready to go, we have um, a template which kicks you off with a blank um, Nextflow pipeline, but with lots and lots of boilerplate code built in already for you uh, to basically kick you off with the best practice. Um, we initially said when we started then, of course, that this was kind of a a useful thing for you but now more and more we're saying this is pretty much a requirement if you want to have a, a pipeline with nf core um the reason is that we add lots of functionality to these this template into our pipelines and there's an automatic synchronization mechanism and um, so that keeps your pipeline up to date as we add things in in the main template and if you're not using that template at all you kind of you can fall behind which is a bit tricky so anyway this is a fantastic tool whether you're part of NF Core or not, to have a, a template to kick you, kick you off with a kind of best practice. And you do that by running this command NF Core and then create, and it prompts you for a name and description and author, and then generates this, um, this kind of template for you. Um, the helper tools also have a command called lint, which does kind of code linting, and, and basically checks for lots of things that we require your NF Core pipeline to do. And this is where we get quite strict with the best practices. Um, and basically the idea is this run, you run as often as possible. When you generate the new pipeline, you shouldn't have any test failures off a template. And then as you add code, you keep running it and keep checking and make sure that you haven't accidentally deleted something or whatever. The other thing is as we change the guidelines in NF Core, then these tests will change. And um, so you might find that you have new failures which you didn't have before, and that's because we want you to change something or update. What you can see here is a bunch of warnings. So saying certain software packages here are, are not the latest available. So you probably want to update them. Um, but you can also see lots of warnings about a to-do string. And what this comes down to is that the, uh, the template to help you get started has lots of comments in the code, which just say to do. And it says, you should edit the code in some way here. You should add something. You should change this. This is just an example code. And those NF core lint tests just pick these up just so that it's obvious to you. So when you get started, you can just work through all these, find them all, uh, and it basically kind of helps hold your hand and gets you started with, with getting up to a fully fledged pipeline. These tests also run automatically on GitHub. So uh, we have GitHub Actions set up, uh, should be on your forks and also on the main end of core repository. So every time you push a commit, every time you open a pull request, all of these tests run and, and will clearly tell you if something's wrong. And one of the things we've added more recently is if this is on a branch, it will even um, add a comment to your pull request if something's wrong saying saying that. And each one of these is a hyperlink to a documentation where you can find more information about that specific test. Right, so off you go, you write your pipeline, you test it, everything works, it's brilliant. You're ready for your first release. Um, and so the final step really is to come back to the NF4 community for, for review and release. Uh, this happens via GitHub. We do it as much as possible through GitHub. Um, and so we have a kind of a community review, we call it, where we try and get some other people who are not necessarily involved with the initial development to read through your code and make suggestions and ask questions. Um, and once that's all for, sorted, you, you make a release. Um, that kicks off a whole load of automated testing and a whole load of automation, for example, with the website and other things, which start to generate all of these identifiers and update things all over the place. When you do a release, we also generate a stable DOI. You get a DOI through Zenodo, both for the whole workflow, but also for every single release. 
which is great for reproducibility and for citations. You can refer to the specific pipeline that you use for this analysis. And something new that we're bringing in now is um, benchmarking using a grant from AWS. So now every time you run a release um, of your pipeline, it will kick off a workflow on AWS. And if you've set up the configuration for it, which is one of those to do's, then it will run with whatever full scale data set that you specify. So on GitHub, where we commit, we do a very minimal test, just with the tiniest test data bar you can find, which should just run in a minute or two. But this benchmark should be with a full scale data set. Um, and the hope is that that stress tests the pipeline a little bit. We also are going to make those results available on the website so that people who are interested in the pipeline can browse through the outputs of the, of the pipeline without having to run it themselves. And also means that because we have this for every release of your pipeline, we can kind of compare what's changed and, and benchmark any changes, um, especially for larger facilities that might have to do accreditation, things like this. This can be really, really helpful. Right. So um, hands up, I don't know anything about proteomics. Uh, I work in genomics and I always have. Um, and you can kind of see with when you look down the list of, of pipelines at NFCore that, that most of the pipelines are genomics and that's purely a function of the, the networking and the people who were, who were started in it in the early days. But there are some proteomics pipelines and it, that, that part of the community is growing. And this is where we'd really like to get more people involved. Um, so I thought I'd put in a couple of slides about which, which pipelines we have already for proteomics. Um, the first one, which I think is the most heavily used is the, the proteomics uh, LFQ pipeline. Hopefully you guys will understand more of, more of what these descriptions mean than me, um, but you can dig out more details if you follow that link. Um, all of these pipelines are still under various stages of development. This one is, is in kind of pretty much production use now. You can see in that little stats graph that it's being, it's being downloaded by a lot of different people. Um, and it's got quite a lot of commits and different forks and by different people. So it's being actively worked on by, by especially Julianus. Um, you might be in this meeting if you have any questions. Um, yeah, I'm here. <laughs> um, and uh, and is I guess, kind of working towards its first release. Um, next up, we have a pro pipeline called um, Dioproteomics by, by Leon Bickman, who's uh, another kind of major uh, contributor for proteomics stuff, um, which is to do with uh, mass, mass spec measurements. Um, this one similar, kind of in a development state, but, but pretty well used and pretty stable at this point, I think. Um, one of the older ones we have is called MHC quant, which is specifically for um, identifying peptides from mass spec data. Um, this one, I think, don't quote me on this, but I think is slated for a release this week, first release. Uh, it's been around for a long time, actually, but, and it's kind of had different bursts of development work, but I think now it should be heading towards its first stable release, which is really exciting. Um, I saw some chat about setting up that AWS benchmark data sets on, on this pipeline. Um, and finally, that we have a pipeline called DDAMS Proteomics, uh, written by Jorit, who's also at SciLife Lab in, in Sweden, the same as me. Um, this one, I think, has fallen a bit behind his fork recently, so could probably benefit from a bit more kind of community input on the reviewing. I think that was what was problematic, was back, this was contributed quite early when we had basically no one else doing proteomics within NFCore, and um, struggled to find anyone to really help review his code. Uh, so it'd be great to try and get Joy involved a bit more again. And, and I think those guys, the, the Letio Lab in, in Stockholm, have got quite a few Nextflow pipelines, which are all using the NFCore template. Um, so it'd be great to get him involved a bit more. All right, yeah, live demo. Whew. Let's see how this goes. <laughs> so uh, one of the new features that we've added just over the summer, which um, I thought it's worth bringing, kind of pointing out, because I think it's pretty cool, is to do with um, schema. And this is a, a new method to uh, basically describe the different inputs that the pipeline takes in a structured manner. So I'm going to just kind of quickly demo one of the things that we can do with this. If I go to the NFCore website and I type in proteomics.fq, you can see the results of this popping up in a few places. Um, firstly, we can we hit usage to get the usage documentation. Uh, and when I scroll down through all the parameters, you can see these are really nicely formatted with like little icons and stuff and different help text. Um, and all of this is based from actually a structured JSON document, which we can reuse all over the place. Um, and so it's very easy to maintain and very easy to write. 
uh, and kind of can be used in a lot of different places. So it's used in the health documentation here, but also we've got this button up here that says launch. If I click that, it takes me to a structured form, a web form, uh, uh, with lots of different parameters for the pipeline, which, uh, which we know about. Um, they're all described, you can click on help text. So this is really a big focus on, on user accessibility and user friendliness. If I click launch, you can see that it automatically validates the input. So it tells me that there's a couple of problems here that the input is required to run the pipeline and then also that the database is required. Um, and, uh, and once everything is green and happy, I can then click launch. This um, saves that set of parameters for me. I can either copy this to a file, just a JSON file, and manually run Nextflow with no other tools, just exactly as you would normally run Nextflow. Uh, or I can copy this command uh, and type that into my, my command prompt on the left. Um, so if I, if I paste that in, this is the NF Core helper tool on the left in my command prompt. And you can see it's talked to the website, it's found that ID, it's pulled all these parameters that I've just put into the website. And now it can run the pipeline for me directly. And if I hit, hit yes, then it will just kick it off and run next level for me. So this is super user friendly. And it's especially important in these bigger pipelines, which are starting to get a lot of different parameters. Um, you can walk through this. You don't have to kind of go away and dig through the code or dig through the usage documentation. You can just kind of fill in this form um, and click your way through it and get be assured as you're filling it in through that validation that you're doing things correctly. One of the very recent additions is this new button here as well. So the guys who wrote Nextflow have got a startup company now called Secura, and they've developed a new product called Nextflow Tower. Now Tower is a separate, totally separate system to Nextflow, but it can monitor running Nextflow jobs, and it can also launch Nextflow jobs uh, on the cloud, so AWS or Google, and pretty soon I think the, at least the enterprise version will be able to launch workflows on local HPC systems as well. So we've managed to put together an integration with these guys. So if I click this button, it will kick off Nextflow Tower in a new tab. And again, it's pulled all of these parameters from my workflow. I can select the, the AWS set I have um, environment that I've already set up. It does that most of that for you. If I put in a test profile, and then it will kick off this workflow for me um, on AWS in real time, which is super cool. So you can see it's just spinning up AWS batch in the background and you can kind of follow the execution log in real time. So in terms of kind of accessibility and user friendliness, this is, this is really, really good. Um, finally, of course, not everyone has access to the internet to, or maybe they don't want to type in their specific details into a web form. So you can also do basically all of this by on the command line by doing NF4 launch um, and it uses the same schema and builds uh, takes you through on the command line, um, different things. It says, okay, we need to specify the input. It's got the documentation in place. I can type it in and it just does the same thing. Last thing on this um, is that, of course, JSON documents are a pain to maintain and write. You don't really want to be writing JSON. So the first thing we actually built was a, a builder. Uh, and if I do end of course schema build, it will find the schema in this pipeline and um, I can launch a web builder where I can kind of just drag and drop these, these options to reorganize the JSON file and, and build them. Uh, you know, change the, the icons, write some help text and mark down everything. And when I'm done, that saves it all as, as, as a JSON document and, and saves it back to my, my work. So none of this is next very specifically. These are all bolt on helper tools. Uh, which we've written to help developers work with Nextflow pipelines um, and help end users launch and use Nextflow pipelines in as standardized and uh, structured way as possible using kind of community best practices where we can. This is using JSON schema, which is a kind of standard. And um, we're going to be tying this in pretty soon, hopefully to, um, to Workflow Hub with their efforts on, on um, research objects, crates and things like this. So I think it's really cool. Right, or I should say, when I first did that live demo, I discovered a bug. So if you try to actually launch a pipeline with that wizard now, uh, right now, it might break, but it will probably be fixed by lunchtime. Um, <laughs> Finally, I just wanted to do a quick note on DSL2. So um, Nextflow is itself a, a domain specific language, a DSL. And uh, if you're involved, been involved with Nextflow at all, you might have heard about DSL2, or you might even be writing pipelines using DSL2 already. 
it's basically a new syntax for writing next row pipelines. Um, we have been fairly heavily involved with the development of DSL2, some testing. Um, we've been slightly hesitant to jump on too early until it had a stable release because the syntax was changing a lot and we wanted our pipelines to be super reproducible uh, and not specifically tied to like random versions of next row. Um, but that has now happened that uh, just over the summer, DSL2 hit a stable release for NextFlow and is now kind of ready to go. And off the back of this, we're developing kind of a new initiative, which we've called NF4 modules. And this is a GitHub repository where we're starting to collect um, basically little chunks of pipelines, what we've called modules. Uh, so in this case, FastQC, which corresponds to a specific tool called FastQC. And the idea is that now when you're writing your pipeline, you do a mixture of writing your pipeline and also writing modules for the pipeline within NF4. Uh, within the core modules, um, and they can be either remote or not. So if it's never going to be shared, you just do it as a part of your pipeline. But if it could be used by other people, by other pipelines, you put it in a central kind of repository. And then this helper, helper command here, part of the NF4 suite, um, helps you as a developer to use these modules within your pipeline. So you just type NF4 modules install, and then it will pull those files and handle all of the, the version checking and hashing and stuff. So this is still very, very new. Um, we've got our first few pipelines are kind of now established pipelines are being converted to DSL2. So we're still kind of writing these new guidelines because it's going to be a huge change for us. Um, and the, the template as it stands is still DSL1, but um, towards hopefully the end of the year, um, maybe start of next year, we'll see how quick we are. Uh, we're going to push out a version 2.0 of the the NF core pipeline template, and that will be DSL2. And we're going to hopefully try and bring all of the NF core pipelines into DSL2. It's extremely powerful. Right. Um, so, it's finding out more information about NF core, um, we managed to get a publication out earlier this year. And um, so, you can read about the NF core community um, on, on Nature Biotech. Uh, the, the, the paper itself is very, very short. The supplementaries is basically the paper we all originally wrote, which is quite a lot longer and actually goes into a lot more detail about how we manage things and how we automate things if you're interested. Um, and, but the main thing is if you if you want to get involved, please do go to our website, click that little green button in the top right that says join uh, and find all the details about how to get involved. The main one, like I say, is Slack. Uh, that's where we discuss everything. That's where you'll kind of meet people and ask for help. And um, all the work is done through GitHub, and then we have outreach through Twitter and, and more recently through YouTube. Right. Um, I never actually introduced myself. <laughs> it's not very important. I'm not here to talk about me. I want to talk about NF Core. But, uh, but my name was, was Phil Yules, still is Phil Yules. Uh, and I work in Sweden at SciLife Lab at the Genomics Infrastructure there. And then you can find out more information at those links if you're curious. Uh, and with that, I'm happy to take any questions, but also that I'm happy to kind of kick off a discussion. Um, more than just questions, if possible. Thanks a lot. Very interesting stuff. There's a lot of development going on. Uh, it's, it's not that long I looked into the website and there's much change again. So it is very uh, exciting, I have to say. So are there any questions? Uh, Salvador? Yes. Thanks, Phil, for for really nice presentation. Um, I'm curious about the benchmarking part of the EW, EWS, because you're saying, well, I have a pipeline, I can run a full, a full data set on that. Uh, mm -hmm. Are you just capturing technical uh, aspects of the running or when you run the pipeline, or are you also uh, taking care of the scientific part? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, that's a fairly open question at the moment because this is still quite new. Um, we got these credits from AWS to, to actually run the com compute this year, and we're still, it's taken a long time to set up the infrastructure because we have to set up the AWS workflows, we have to set up the, the GitHub automation, all this kind of stuff. But that's now in place, and now we're, we're really starting to push pipeline authors to actually add the full scale data sets. Um, and then we'll see what people use them for. My hope is exactly what you say that we'll start to be able to add in actual biological inter interpretation. You know, a taxi does um, differential expression between groups. So between replicates, do we see the same differential genes coming up? Um, I'm sure there will be equivalents for proteomics. You know, uh, the, the simple stuff is obviously to check the kind of file metadata, like does this file exist and, and how big is it? To be honest, for that kind of thing, we're pushing harder on the modules 
um, because we want to have unit testing on a kind of a sub workflow level rather than a whole work or as well as a whole workflow level. And so that's something we're scaling up in a big way there. If you run this tool, does it generate this file? Does it contain this string? Is it above this file size? Um, and, and so that will really help that side of reproducibility. And then the pipeline test will be more, like you say, hopefully for kind of probably manual inspection and, and benchmarking. But if you have any ideas for how to do this in a, in a good way, how to write it up, we, we're, this is right for the picking. We're just kind of, we're, we're looking for input now. So. Yeah. Actually, uh, I'm quite interested on that because we, we are running the uh, Open Event. Open Event is the Elixir benchmarking platform where we support communities doing scientific benchmark. And we have three levels. And our level three is we get the workflow and then we run it for them. The specific data set and then we compare the technical and scientific performance. And basically you are doing somehow what we are aiming to do. We have a small prototype. So it will be great if we can continue talking to see uh, ways to collaborate and, and work together on this kind of yeah. thing. No, absolutely. That sounds great. <laughs> okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, a little comment from my side also. Um, since like last week, I think um, the the buckets of the results uh, were made public, right, Phil? Yeah. Um, like this is uh, like one of the first steps that was needed because we are running uh, a ground truth data set where there is a fixed uh, where fixed concentrations of proteins, and um, so basically what we are doing is like producing a PDF to see which proteins are uh, deregulated and we use this as kind of a check um, currently manual like so you have to look at the pdf to see if everything's right but you could also like check the deviation from the expected um, fold change for example and this is what we are doing yeah uh, uh, something kind of tying into this uh, it's probably obvious i hope by my lack of knowledge about proteomics but one of the things I love about NF Core is that each pipeline is kind of handled by its own group of kind of domain specific experts on that topic. Uh, we maintain it, we run it, we answer the questions, and then we have kind of have a, a, a wider team who kind of collaborate on the technical stuff. Um, and so I think this is a real strength of NF Core that um, it's kind of one big community spanning lots of things. We're collaborating on the more common things like like these technical aspects where we can all kind of have the same kind of setup, but also having kind of smaller sub-communities who, who know about the biology. So you, you mentioned that, uh, so ideally you will have only uh, one pipeline for data type. Uh, we are doing exactly the opposite in the, uh, as group because we are trying to compare different pipelines on the same uh, data type and using, for instance, this ground truth data set to see where the pipelines might have a problem or how they compare because that's one of our in our field it's one of the big problems that you get a lot of different results if you use different pipeline and uh, that's like 70 80 percent uh, of the coverage you have or less so how if we wanted to and we want to uh, add our pipelines and of course how do we avoid trouble with you guys because we are doing exactly the same type of type but have like six or i think five pipelines we will have in there or want to have in there? So a, a little bit comes down to the definition of, of pipeline, I guess. Um, what we want to avoid is having a totally different set of documentation, different way of running the pipeline, uh, different way of pulling the pipeline and everything. We want to have one place to go to if you want to run a data type. What we're fine with and what we encourage is having different ways to run that pipeline. So if you like different workflows within a single pipeline. So if you look at the RNA pipeline that we have, you can choose to use star to align, you can use HiSat2, you can use salmon, you can count genes with feature counts, you can count genes with RSAM. Uh, the methylation pipeline also has a whole, there's basically two pipelines within one. Um, and then I, I actually did that so that I could benchmark two different analysis types within, but it's still within one pipeline. We still have one default, which will be the sensible for most people. Um, and, um, it's still kind of a central place to go to, which is easy to find. Uh, so hopefully that makes it clear. Um, of course, the downside of doing it this way is that the pipelines can get big um, and difficult to maintain, which has become a bit of an issue, for example, for the RNA pipeline, which is massive now. But um, 
what will come to the rescue there is, is DSLT and this modularity, because then we can actually literally have defined sub workflows within a pipeline, which are kept completely physically separate. You can run them as a named, um, so you can say, and of course, next we run RNA seq workflow PISAT, and it will run that pipeline, which is like a subset of a larger pipeline, things like this. It makes it much more modular, it makes the code much more manageable, and then you can easily do benchmarking between different types of analysis within the same workflow. Would it be also make it more manageable to to merge like different Nextflow pipelines we already set up and then put them together? I assume that's probably not that easy. <laughs> it depends on the specifics. Um, yeah, I mean, this is this is something we hit, we hit occasionally. Is is kind of it's always a bit tricky when people come and say, "I've I've developed this fully functioning stable pipeline. I just want to add it to NF Core because." That's not really how we, we set up the community. We set up the community to kind of come together to write pipelines from scratch, if you know what I mean. So there's always a little bit of pain <laughs> involved uh, if you have if you have something to kind of bring it in and kind of bend it to follow all the same guidelines and stuff. Um, but the specifics of exactly how to go about doing that is warrants a longer, more technical discussion, depending on exactly what you've got and where where the end, end result will be. Yeah, it's a little bit harder because I think our pipelines there, they're not in a way that you can just take one tool from one pipeline, put it in the other one. They get easily into very incompatible uh, parts where file format and everything does not fit anymore. Mm. That's a little bit our problem we have. That's why we set up everything completely separately because they are not that exchangeable in that sense. I mean, if, if I end up with different data, it, there's also the definition of what's the same and what's different is is flexible. Mm. If um, if they're different data types or different formats and stuff like this, then then it might be fine to have a set of pipelines. Um, and like I say, with with DSL two, we'll be able to basically be able to write multiple pipelines with it one. So then they'll it's entirely possible to have totally separate from one another. Yeah, well, that's also quite encouraging. This DSL two, I have to take a look for. Yeah, yeah, said. Um, thanks for the talk, actually. Uh, um, I think may, my, my, may, my question actually is related with the previous topic. I mean, there is something in proteomics is slightly different than RNA-seq and, and probably genomics when you have really a stable, stable, stable tools that can be used in cloud environments. It's slightly different in proteomics. I mean, in cloud environment, there is only, there is a, massive amount of tools that they are not coupled very well together. No, what people use it, but they are not really the most popular one. Probably the Windows ones and the no non-distributed ones are the more popular ones. Then what Vi was saying actually is, it's difficult to come up with a community around a, a pylon that says, this is the most stable one. This is the one that every, we want that everyone use that. Okay. Then even if, um, Julianus and the OpenMS and myself, we have been working on one. That will not be something that people can say, oh, that's for labor free. This is the one that people should use. Yeah. Because uh, there is a lot of, um, you know, the debate, but also the, 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 the changing one tool by, by, by another one can actually make the whole thing really more different. Mm -hmm. What Proteomics is doing right now is moving into and we have a paper around that how we can which you move into more like a cloud-based linux let's say environments and what vi is saying that we actually as a community we are working on testing and comparing tools for this type of movement okay when we said okay now instead of having this feature finder Tool, which is in OpenMS, we should use something else, or we should use this. Uh, or for the downstream analysis, actually, we should use this package. Or, or for the, for example, for the PTM localization score, we should use this or, or, or something else. And my question is, it should be, and of course, uh, the place to do this kind of of, of pilot research. Can we embrace that we can, for example, in the future have multiple labor free pipelines like the one developed by us but also others that we can basically say what are the difference between them because that's that's the play where the proteomics community is yeah and it's just completely different from the from the rna sql and that's i guess the vi 
Vice question, and um, um, and probably it would be also my question if NF Core is the place for that. Yeah, um, it's yeah, it's really it's a really good question. It's really it's it's kind of uh, like you say, this is the kind of thing that we need to figure out. So, and it's one of the things that's a bit maybe unexpected is that um coming from one field i kind of come with a whole set of assumptions and kind of uh <laughs> which are not necessarily valid for everyone um and stuff like yeah kind of i, I have run into this before with proteomics actually like like you say kind of point and click uh interface tools which are difficult to put into workflows and stuff um so i don't have a solid answer for you yes or no um i think it probably warrants more specific uh, discussion. So if you have like, okay, these are the things we want to do and like, then we can kind of chat about it on Slack and, and like, I, for me, I don't see a big difference between having multiple separate pipelines and having one pipeline with sub workflows within it. I, for me, the, the code is basically the same. The way you run them is basically the same. Um, but it kind of comes with the advantage of, of being simpler to, to maintain, simpler to, to manage. Um, I, if you don't want to have a default because there is no consensus over which approach is, is best, then that's fine. Uh, we can we can throw a warning message when you try and run it without any argument saying you must choose one. <laughs> uh, let, let's, let's refine a little bit more the question. Hmm. If the proteomics community is developing pylums to do benchmark, hmm. it is NetFlow the uh, NF Core the place for that or it should be the final decision after all this benchmark uh, research part. That's that's uh, because I know also that the uh, I mean benchmarking is kind of a, something like is really active. But from my experience with Julianos and the pilot that we put in NF Core, it's actually more a production setup. Basically, you really have made your decision about what to do. Um, is basically how do you play in a, how do you put a workflow into a production kind of environment that can do tests for you, uh, uh, have a benchmark data set that give you the exact uh, results that you want and so on and so forth. It actually doesn't look the play for me for playing uh, with data and, and tools and combining tools and then get the results out of it because the amount of work that we need to put to put something in NF or working is is, is quite a lot, yeah. yeah. And that's that is my impression, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. So I would say the number one priority for us with NF core pipelines is that they should be stable and reproducible. Okay. If your pipelines are not stable, then they're probably not ready for NF core. Okay. But that's not to say that you can't use NF core tools and framework and stuff. And when they are stable, come <laughs> come along. You know, okay. it doesn't mean that you can't community and ask for help and, and whatnot. Yeah, sorry. So, uh, no, I just wanted to partially answer Jasset, because Jasset, you are making really nice comments, and I can share the views that we have in OpenEvent as a platform for benchmarking. We're not just interested in the technical performance, but especially in the scientific performance, because depending on the problem that people have at hand, one pilot or another might be the choice, right? So if it's one pilot doing well in one type, data type or a specific organism or whatever, you will go for that. But I'm imagining sort of a circuit where we have, for instance, workflows in Workflow Hub. You have all the benchmark done somehow in Open Bench, and then the most stable ones or the what the ones that are systematically performing well being in, in FS Core. So people can say, okay, I like this one. I want to use it. Where do I use it? Either I download it or I go to a place like MS Core and then I can have access and you know start in production somehow. And in any time you can go back and revisit. Is it still doing this workflow fine or is any new one that eventually have overtaken? Yeah. And then, I mean, as a community, you say, well, there is a new one that has been taken to the initial ones it's not yet in, in the core. So you can, as a community, say, okay, let's go for this one. Not the 20, 30, or 100 different workflows, but just select them. Because, of course, there is a massive effort to maintain them and, and to document and then to keep up. With them. But it's a little bit, maybe it's a silly uh, view or super optimistic view, but I think it might be something to work. I think, I think it's nice. And, and I think there's definitely some middle grounds. Like, 
the, the best kind of example I have is my personal experience with the, the methylation pipe where I, I have these two separate side-by-side -side workflows within the same pipeline. I benchmark them against each other. Uh, I chose one and I use that, but other people use the pipeline and they use the other because no benchmark is perfect for every use case. Um, and so I think it's like, if, if it's stable, if it works for people, if it's reproducible, then it's fine to put it in there, even if it's not necessarily the top scoring on X or Y benchmark, that's fine. If it's under development, if it's kind of a bit tricky and fiddly to get it to work and it's not really ready to use in a large scale environment, then maybe it's not ready for NF4. Right. So I would also like to comment on that because I think in our case, the workflows, at least most of them are widely used. So they are, as they are used, they should be robust enough, but uh, are not because we just set them up in next flow and uh, one is making here and there mistakes or don't really care about this and that. And, and in order to do a good benchmarking, I think you need robust workflows. Otherwise, uh, you won't be able to do the benchmarking because you don't set the parameters right. There's something going wrong here. You leave one workflow out because you forgot about this detail. So I think you need uh, a certain robustness in your workflows to do a decent benchmarking. Otherwise, you won't go there, get there. And that's what we thought also. Uh, I also thought that NF Core could be a good place to go because you have certain uh, checks and 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 uh, you're auto you're enforcing people to be more careful and producing a more stable, robust environment. And and then that's why I see it also a little bit that. And of course, could help us maybe not getting a full production ready workflow, but at least something getting nearer there using you guys' expertise on setting it up. Because yeah. then we can do our benchmarking better and decide which one we might want to put into production or merge into a generalized one or not. So I think that was one of the ideas at least I had on that. I think. Can I ask something? I mean, also related with. Okay, let me see if I. Okay. Um, I think another strong point for NF Core, as far as I understand, is actually maintainability and support for the things that has been produced. And I guess all these benchmarking workflows uh, tends to be done, and then you do the benchmark, you decide what is best, and it remains there forever, and no one or people move on because they just did the. What actually I understand from NF core idea is that you actually are active, not active, well, active maintainers of the, of the workflow, which means that I know the point of having guidelines produce a strong thing, but it's more a NF core idea is maintaining the thing and being involved with the community to help do uh, training on the workflow and so on and so forth. When the benchmark use case is more about proving that something works, what is best and what is not the best thing to go forward. But then it remains, let's say more stable or more stable in the long term and so on. And the people less compromise with the use of it because it's only for experts, let's say in some way, when the workflow is more for a product, a, a production workflow is more for users, um, uh, bug fixing, some things like that. What, and I think this is the second thing to take care of it. I mean, and I think wherever people in proteomics doing benchmark move into next NF core and the next NF core as a community needs to decide what means, what is the, the future for all of this? Because, you know, if I arrive there and then I see three workflows, two that are benchmarked around, for example, labor free, and then the labor free one that has been developed by kind of a community what do I do? Do I go for the benchmark? It's confusing for the user. And I think from the, what I get from your message is basically you want to have something that is stable, maintained by the community and that people can get and pick from there. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. So one of those guidelines I mentioned is that every pipeline should have a names maintainer. Uh, it doesn't have to be the main person who does most of the coding, but there should be someone who has a name there and you can go and ask that person <laughs> about something, you know. And the idea exactly is that not you add it and forget it, it should be an active, kind of actively maintained thing. We also help with that as much as possible. So there's that the template with its automated synchronization updates. So we automate everything we possibly can. So once you've released your pipeline, 
you'll start getting pull requests to it with updates to the to the boilerplate kind of core code automatically. Um, but there's there's always ongoing maintenance because that that unfortunately is the the curse of, of open source. Is that if you want your stuff to be used, there is always ongoing maintenance. But but it is worth saying that the involvement of the maintainers within the community varies from pipeline to pipeline, um, and they change over time. We have pipelines that we developed at SciLife Lab, um, and then we maintained them for a while, and then someone another group came in and used them a lot and developed them a lot, and then they kind of took over that mantle. So it doesn't need to be fixed, um, and to some extent, you can kind of choose how much involvement you have in the community, but we do want there to be someone around who still kind of has some responsibility for that workflow and, and make sure it isn't just abandoned. Well, that could be also something beneficial for you guys. So if you are, if you say, okay, uh, um, let's, let's put like, uh, or start with a pipeline, which is kind of starting up, but it's, it's an established one, but somebody else implemented it in Nextflow, which is not one of the main developers of that softwares. Uh, like we here, uh, and and then uh, hope that uh, it becomes uh, sufficiently popular that the original developers hook up and actually take care of it, which would be the best thing because they know their tools. It's not us. Uh, we are just using them. I know a little bit about them, but the actual developers might not always be interested in uh, having their tools in NF Core, Nextflow, or have other priorities, uh, or do not know about it, for instance. So uh, that could be also maybe something... Uh, yeah, so, so I think we're saying, okay, I want only one pipeline for data type and, uh, and so on. That might be a little bit drastic, but I don't want to criticize. But <laughs> so, so in that sense, uh, you're closing a few doors, I think. Also, yeah. those might uh, pop up. And, uh, yeah, and, and I mean, some of the guidelines that I put in two years ago, we're starting to, to, to tweak and, and modify. So if we decide uh, that this is a major blocker, that this is just this is causing more trouble than it's solving and of course we can always review all these things so um, um my opinion on this is i think it um you could probably make it to like one pipeline but there sh should be something in this pipeline or some mechanism in nf core that uh kind of separates the different running styles more clearly. So if we, if, because if we just, if we start, we, uh, we can do like modules and uh, sub workflows for each of them and then just put a large if case in the beginning. But I think what would happen is that the, like for example, the JSON schema would be incredibly complex because you, all the parameters are just uh, um, mixed of the different workflows. And so we would probably need something to um, that uses some additional uh, tabs in the uh, on the website, for example, like the different running styles for a certain pipeline. Or I don't know. Exactly. Or, or split up the schema a workflow or something. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no, that's a good point. I hadn't really thought about that, but you're completely right that that will become a mess very quickly. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm very interested in continuing this discussion. Um, I think we should uh, we should we should hop onto onto of course Slack and because uh, if we can find it, it's it's a thorny issue. It's definitely a thorny issue. Um, it's come up before, um, and if we can find something that everyone's happy with, then yeah, I would, I would, that would save me a headache as well. <laughs> yeah. There was Juan. You want to say something? You have to put on the mic. Muted. Yeah. Hello? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have a very much nearby question um, about Nextflow. Um, is it possible to exchange uh, workflows um, between Nextflow and Galaxy or the other, the other way around? Um, yes and no. Mostly no. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, Galaxy uses the CWL files or uh -huh. workflow language, um, which is one, I mean, there's kind of a, a few key big players in, in the workflow field now, and Nextflow is one and CWL is another. Um, and so Nextflow has a slightly different kind of 
ethos and a different, slightly different way it works to CWL. CWL, you define the entire workflow in a static file and when you run, blah, 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 and do it. Whereas yeah. Nextflow is kind of more deterministic where it's like a, a like a push system where you start off the top and then it's kind of auto-generated as it goes along, um, which is so is, in my mind, is an advantage because it means it scales better uh, and also means you can have kind of logic branches and stuff like this. Um, but this means that you can't write an exploit pipeline in CWL. Um, however, this has been a bit of a recurring question and an issue with the next way developers. Especially. And what has been talked about is the possibility to export a, a, a run workflow, it, which is then, of course, when you're looking back retrospectively, is then static uh, as CWL. You're describing a simple run of next code and well, then you could import into Galaxy. Okay. Um, as to the latest status of that, I'm not sure yet. But, uh, yeah, sorry. So from next flow, you can eventually import, um, export some workflows to into Galaxy, but not the other way around. That is my understanding of it. Others might disagree. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, also, I, I'm, I don't know very much about Galaxy. So um, if they, okay. I don't know whether Galaxy has other ways of running pipe. I, I I I think the last time I did this is when the workflows are simple, it's possible. Uh, that is one percent only of the workflows in NF course. When they become when they start using um, uh, Ruby and um, really like all the channels possibilities and things like that, then it's impossible. Then I would say mm -hmm. only one percent it would be possible to do that. My question is more. It's probably not for you because oh, I know that you are involved in NetFlow, but uh, uh, not really like a, a, an active maintainer of NetFlow or anything like that. What are the plans? If, because I knew, I know that at some point it was really important for uh, interoperability between workflows and so on and so on. But now I know that the things in NetFlow are becoming more complex, and with NF Core things are more becoming like. Um, I will not say pr uh, uh, proprietary, but that the, the things are getting more strong, more focused on the community of NF Core and Nextflow. Do you think this is still a priority to be cross compatible with other stuff? Or and also, I have seen that platforms, rather than working in the cross compatible thing, what for example DNA Nexus, I'm working with them in another project, and what they are doing is supporting the, the environments rather than cross-compatible, then DNA Nexus, now you can run Galaxy if you want, CWL, uh, um, Wiggle, and Nextflow also. I mean, the cloud the cloud environments are basically saying you or the bioinformatic cloud companies, what they're saying is you can run whatever you want, but no co cross-compatible, but allowing to run the infrastructure because everyone is in containers, Conda by containers, and and so on. What do you think is the future? I mean, it's, yeah. it's like I said, or? Yeah, so, so I, I think it's really interesting. I think that the main problem with having interoperability between all the different languages is that by definition, if you want that, you have to kind of conform to the minimum feature set yeah. of all the languages. You have to say, OK, this is available in every single language, so we can support that. And so if you want 100% compatibility with CWL or whatever, you can't have any of the more advanced stuff that maybe you could have if you stick with just next week. So I am not sure that the payout of looking for 100% compatibility is worth that. Okay. Um, however, like you say, more and more systems and platforms are, are having the option to run different systems. Like Docstore, that I mentioned earlier, that started off with CWL, but they, you can run Nextflow workflows there and they index them and they store the metadata automatically in the same kind of system. So I think it doesn't have to be a problem, um, but of course other people disagree with me. I know that for a fact. <laughs> yeah, some I, of if, I, if, I, if I can comment on that, there is a consistent effort in EOS Live, specifically in Workflow Hub, to have Aero create, to have the abstract specification of the workflow in CWL, and then the specific implementation in NetFlow, Galaxy, and Nine, I think at the moment, the three, three of them. So you might have some automation of the transfer from one to another. But as you were saying, Philip, it is really difficult to have 100, because you, you are not, people are not reinventing the wheel 100%. So it's like, well, 
this can do specifically this aspect better, the other ones, and so on and so forth. So you can automatize, I don't know, let's say 80% of the stuff, but eventually you will need some manual curation just to finalize and say, okay, I have you know, transfer or convert one from, 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 from another. Yeah, absolutely. And actually, so I got some people from Workflow Hub got in touch with me at, at BOSC uh, this year, this summer, and I've been working on that. I haven't had much time to do it yet, but over the summer. And I actually have some prototype codes to generate RO create um, metadata for the NF Core pipeline. So my hope is that soon we'll be able to generate this automatically and um, have RO crates for every NF Core pipeline, which are then shared with Workflow Hub and listed. And, and exactly that you kind of have that kind of middle layer. You have like the metadata, which is standard between every language. And that means that all these different systems can have a, a consistent kind of infrastructure which can run every language, but the actual engine underneath is still bespoke. I have another question. Um, so, so I think that to do all this, the most apparent incompatibility of, of just moving a workflow to different uh, platform like Nextflow to Alexi, because I think one, big part of the difference are the shims, so like small file conversion, small things here and there, which are necessary to make them uh, compatible. You have to change some small thing here and there. Um, do you have in NF Core a way or are you planning to do something with them? So to have them like um, marked or, or having a specific way of dealing with these small changes? So have it as a def separate process or something like that? Or did you use what are you thinking about this? So, not that I'm aware of is a short answer. Um, but I mean, of course, if, if someone wants this or needs this, then no one's stopping them from, from going ahead with it. Uh, all of the NF Core pipelines are uh, uh, open source, and we're kind of quite hardcore open source, and that we want people to take them and build them and do other stuff with them, and, you know. So if someone wants to convert an NF core pipeline to Galaxy via whatever and maintain a set of shims to do this in an automated way, then that's, that's brilliant. But I don't know of anyone who's doing it now. Um, and I'm not sure that it's going to be a high priority for the NF core community in the near future. Yeah, not maybe not so much about the conversion, but more about uh, the, the having the shims as uh, maybe a separate entry. So you have more than the organizatorial part of setting up your workflow. You might say, okay, yeah, we, we're running the tool, but the, all the file conversions, all the small little things we have to do, we do it a separate process, for instance. So it's clearly marked as being something done to the data, which is necessary in a separate process. So that's, that's what I'm thinking. So, but you didn't think about anything like that. That could be maybe something interesting or to enforce at some point. I'm not sure I'm totally understands quite what you're getting at, but um... so so for instance, if you you get an output from a tool like database search in our case, and you get a certain file format, which is pep XML, let's say whatever it is, and then you need to change some uh, parts of that file to be able to read uh, read it with the next tool, because it doesn't it reads the same file format but not exactly the same way or maybe your best example is CSV files. So you have to rearrange them to be read in the next tool. Yep. And particularly this conversion, that could be quite important in the sense that uh, that's a part which usually is hidden in between the lines. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, sorry, I'm, I'm with you now. Um, yeah, so that is something, I think we probably have slightly less difficulty, slightly fewer difficulties with file formats maybe in most of the pipelines we have already, um, but for example, a couple of the pipelines, we have um, genome annotation files, which are typically GTF, but some people use GFF. And so some pipelines have the option to give either. And if you give GFF, then there's a process that converts it to GTF, so then it feeds into the rest of the pipeline. Um, so absolutely, yes, that should be done as a process in the workflow, um, just like any other analysis step in the pipeline. If you're going to convert one file or tweak it, then I think it should be in its own stamps kind of pipeline step. And of course, the benefit then, especially with DSL2, then if you add that to NF core modules, then you can reuse that functionality across multiple pipelines if you want. Maybe, I'm not sure if that completely answers your question, but I, yeah, I don't know whether next bit. So, so you, so you, uh, NF core is, uh, is, is then also thinking about or trying to push people towards 
having these as separate processes or separate items, right? That was probably mostly my question, because that would also help to make things compatible between different platforms. Definitely, yeah. It's not something that's really come up, so I'm not sure it's explicitly stated anywhere, but that would be my view, and I think it, I think it was fair to say it probably would be shared with most. Yeah. Cool. More questions? Okay, uh, thanks. Uh, it was a very exciting discussion. I loved it. So I think it was uh, fun. And uh, so I assume that uh, also Philip is available for questions afterwards if you want to. Uh, yeah. And uh, is that I think probably no, go ahead. 